Tonight on the Tuesday Night Movie. She was a filmmaker. He was a writer. She lived in Indiana. He lived in Queens. But their fates were bound together by a terrifying secret. They both loved made-for-TV movies. Based on the shocking true story, Katie Madonna Lee and Louis Jordan star in Mother, Murderer, Podcaster. Hi, this is Mother, Murderer, Podcaster, a show about the most outrageous and the best made-for-TV movies of the 80s and 90s. Hi, I'm Katie Madonna Lee, a filmmaker. And I'm Louis Jordan, a writer and film historian. I grew up watching TV movies. I love them. They're a big influence on my work. And I'm new to TV movies, but I'm excited to learn about them. And this week we're talking about the 1994 TV movie classic, Death of a Cheerleader, originally broadcast as A Friend to Die For, starring Kelly Martin, Tori Spelling, one of the queens of 90s TV movies, and Valerie Harper. TV movie was a movie made specifically to be shown on TV and not in theaters. It started a sometime in the 60s and this was interesting I thought so because at that time movie studios saw TV as kind of a threat they charged huge fees to license their movies to be shown on TV and so the networks were like you know screw that we'll just make our own low budget movies and that'll cost less and so then TV movies really took off and then by the early 70s they were huge and they were uh, TV movies were dominated by two big genres there were horror movies and there were like domestic dramas because the networks wanted to get two different demographics for their ads they wanted moms who buy everything for the household and children and teenagers you know, uh, and so the horror movies were for the kids and the dramas were for the moms. And by the 80s, the horror movies, TV horror movies had sort of gone away, but the women's TV movies were really going strong. And there's kind of this reputation, TV movies have a reputation for being campy and silly and badly made and melodramatic. And some of them are, but some of them are actually fantastic. And in a way, I think something that's special about them is that they're about women. They're about women's lives and issues in women's lives. And even when they're silly, they're talking about like divorce and rape and eating disorders and sexual abuse and cancer and spousal abuse and, you know, things that like theatrical movies weren't really talking about. Um, and because they were made so quickly, sometimes they were, uh, they could go from script to screen in just two months. They reflected the culture in real time. It was like crime, true crime and scandals and what was going on in the country. Um, but I think because they were a lot of times made for and about women, they just weren't considered to be serious. Uh, but then in the, in the 2000s, they sort of faded out and the, we're mostly on a, like HBO and stuff like that. And now it's Lifetime or, you know, uh, but there's something really special about a TV movie. Um, I wonder what, what do you think makes TV movies special? Mary Kathleen Gallagher monologue. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, for me, I grew up as a child watching them with my mom. And to me, the most important thing about TV movies was the female bonding that happened behind doors and female spaces. Yes. Now, this is not something I knew at the time. This is something looking back I see. Yeah. But uh, for me, 
um, my mom was a hairdresser and she owned her own beauty salon and it was like still magnolias in that shop we it's where women gather to talk about their domestic issues their worries their anxieties and their hairdresser did their hair made them feel beautiful and consoled them and oftentimes the subject matter was tabloid culture pop culture true crime and tv movies yes and the reason why tv movies were discussed you know i grew up in the 80s was because oftentimes there were um, huge cultural changes happening and being addressed with tv movies such as aids the ryan white story yeah adam child abduction you know that was adam um and in fact i know my first name is steven was huge yes it was huge like i think like 25 million people watched that it was an event because it was like this could happen to your child like child abduction was a huge thing that got a lot of attention in the 80s and i still remember stranger danger yeah uh you know all those things um kidnappers missing children uh, you know that was a huge part of my childhood and and it it's, that's why it's fitting that it was re, uh, reimagined in the 80s where, you know, milk cartons and children were missing so often. Yeah. But for me, I, why I love TV movies was it was a, a way for females to bond and discuss issues in their lives that are so often not addressed or invisible. Yes. Um, to the world. And it, the bonding wasn't just in the uh, actual story. It was in the buildup, like um, the talking about, the anticipation. Are you going to watch my, um, mm. I know my first name is Steven. Are you going to watch that? Um, are you going, you know, there's a TV movie about a man who is actually experiencing domestic violence. Oh my God, could that happen? Um, there's going to be a TV movie about... The Amy Fisher story. What do you think about that? Yeah, you know? and um, and that stuff wouldn't is, have wouldn't have come up otherwise. But then suddenly that stuff's in the conversation, and it's okay to talk about. Yeah, exactly. It's okay to talk about AIDS and what you you know what you think of it. Like oftentimes, like for instance, there was a woman who did nails at my mom's shop, and uh, I don't know if I'm allowed to say her name, but she did nails and i remember when ryan white the ryan white story was going to come on tv me and my cousins were huge proponents for ryan white we were very we were young and we were like how could they ex, you know bully him how could they do this to him and my mom and my aunts were very like how could they do this to this boy but my mom's nail technician was like if he spit on me i'd kill him you know and that you know she said that um because we were talking about it we were talking about it and what what i'm saying is it's that's how she felt you know it's not the right thing to say it's not a right thing no it isn't but she said that because the the tv we, she was talking about it with a client who pretty much agreed with her so they they were bonding yeah it's a, a form of bonding like you know what I'm saying? Like I, so, and um, oftentimes female bonding is not always kind. <laughs> you know, oftentimes female bonding is over tragedies. You know, sadness, shared grief, pain, suffering, and cruelty. And that's something we see at Death of a Cheerleader, and that's why I loved it so much. Because to me, it. As silly and melodramatic as this is, to me, this is why I love TV movies, is because they reflected how cruel women are to each other. And for men listening, if there are men listening, hopefully there are, yeah. I feel like oftentimes men are very oblivious to this because they're not watching TV movies. A lot of times they're not. They're not going to, like, they're like, oh, TV movies, that's not, that's not manly, you know? Yeah. Oh, where's, where's. There will be blood. Ah, I need something. <laughs> Words of the meat. Like, you know, so they're not, they're looking for the machismo, the grit. Yeah, know? yeah. So when uh, something like Death of a Chiller comes up and you're watching the girls interact and bully the the goth girl and Stacy Lockwood being that cruel, it's like, no, that's that's how how high school was. And actually... That's how my workplaces are with other women. 
Yeah. That's how it still is. That's how women are. They're just, they want a pecking order. And it's even quoted in Death of a Cheerleader where, um, I think, yes, it, it's where the, go- in the ski resort where the goth girl is been humiliated because they read her journal out loud and Kelly Martin is tries to console her and the goth girl is like what just go back and be one of her drones and that is and that is how females bond because they were bonding like the mean girls were all bonding and trying to get it oh Stacy read her read her journal read her journal let's be mean to her let's uh, ha, 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 ha. let's let's exclude a girl and they call it pecking order because chickens do this. Chickens, female chickens, I mean, there's only, you know, chickens are females, but it's called pecking order because this is a behavior of chickens. Yeah. And they get together and three of them will oust one of the, they put them in who's the queen, who's the mother hen. Yeah. And I think this is interesting because humans, females, do the same thing when uh, there's more than two. <laughs> females in a room it's you know um someone always has to be when there's two more than two someone has to be the odd one out so i i really love how uh tori really digs deep into the mean girl you know in this where she wasn't playing the sweet donna martin yeah like the goofy well, like oh, i well, don't know well here let's let's um why don't we start out with the like with the plot what give yes. what's what is this movie about like what's the plot overview real quick um it is actually based on a true story mm-hmm. but of a true crime that happened i believe in the late 80s uh it was a um, young girl who was from the i would say lower middle class side of the tracks yeah of this quaint California City um, and she admired Stacy Lockwood Tori Spelling's character and wanted to be like her and basically uh, got into a argument with her and was embar- afraid that Stacy Lockwood would humiliate her and in the heat of the moment stabbed her to death um, her freshman year of high school yeah, sophomore and year, yeah. This sophomore year, yes. And this basically uh, is the plot of the story. I thought it was interesting the way that they structured the movie in that um, instead of building up to the murder, because we all know that the murder is going to happen. We, it's called, you know, death of a cheerleader or a friend to die for or whatever. But like people have seen this in the papers. They knew it was going to happen. So they open with the murder. They make that the first thing. And then they go back... And then it's like, what led us to this point? Those opening shots of the film, it felt so much like, uh, like, you know, like nothing very bad could ever happen here, you know, yeah. not in our neighborhood. Yeah. And then, um, you know, it's like this, this older guy kind of jogging through this wholesome upper middle class suburbia fantasia. Um, then... We, we see, uh, like, a little clip of Stacy, like, in the car, in the, uh, in the parking passenger lot. Seat. Yeah, in the passenger seat. Yeah. And she's lighting up a joint. And then... Yes! And then we switch to her, like, ringing the doorbell of this real, like, over-the-top wholesome family. Where they're playing, like, a game or something... And the mom's like, oh, you guys. And yeah. And then suddenly Stacy's like the, the good girl and is like, my friend's being really weird. Um, you know, could I, could I use your phone? Um, yeah. And the, 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 the man from this house takes her home. And then uh, in front of her house, she's confronted by this person who we can't really see and she gets stabbed now this introduces the first the first moment that i thought was camp in it because she gets stabbed and it's like it's shot in a way that's very creepy and then tori shouts help i've been stabbed 
<laughs> like at full voice after she'd been stabbed in the chest. I know. And I was like, girl, your lungs are punctured. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, um, so, you know, then now we've got, uh, we've got Kelly Martin, who is, you know, this girl who stabbed her. Um, we, we sort of flip back to like, you know, before all of this and we see Angela, who's played by Kelly Martin, who's like this very good girl. Um, yeah. and She's then we excellent. see, uh, uh, Stacy, who's played by Tori Spelling, who is this queen bee. Now tell me about Kelly Martin. Who was she at this time? What did she mean? <laughs> so Kelly Martin starred on the show <laughs> Life Goes On with Patti Lapone. Yes. And, uh, on that show, she played a, the daughter of a, uh, kind of middle class family um, she was kind. Of, she was the lead, but Kelly Martin in the teen world of fandom was, you know, kind of the, you know, she was a actress, like a wholesome girl. Uh, she definitely wasn't the Alyssa Milano, Shannon Doherty, nine hundred two and O type. Yeah. And and she always played very, I would say, motherly worrisome emotional characters um, often and so th- her, let's say like life goes on and 90210 did not cross paths often yeah you know during this time period because um, life goes on was dealing with HIV and and, and uh, special needs children and things like that but it was a drama yeah you know and kelly was kelly martin was like a wholesome girl next door proper you know worried were she always has the look of worry and hurt yes nobody could do it like kelly martin to me in many ways she was like sally field and sybil Mm, yeah sally field is a good because they both have that that wholesome thing but then there's also like an anxiety to them yes that that yes. that there's like there's more you know because because Sally you know she's got like a tension to her and like a uh, and and that's sort of how this character is like she's very wholesome but she just can't let well enough alone she can't be who she is she is the good Catholic girl and she wants to be the popular girl yes yes and. What I love about Kelly Martin and her acting is she is not afraid to be vulnerable and show weakness and show unattractiveness, you know, like show she goes. And that's what I love about her. She removes vanity from her performance. And when I watch her, I never see narcissism or vanity. I really see her going there. Yes. And 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 that's what I love about this film is because she really could have been campy. She really could have, but God, I feel so bad for her. But she's very sympathetic. Yeah, and and so so the whole thing is that Angela um you know, there's this whole speech the principal gives this speech at the beginning about how we're all winners here and we're going to be winners and she's like, "Yeah, I'm going to be a winner. I'm going to, I just transferred from Catholic school to this public school and I'm going to be a cheerleader and I'm going to be on yearbook and I'm going to be the popular girl and I'm going to be a winner. And she just believes it so wholeheartedly. And the way that she plays it, I saw something sort of childlike and naive about her like she really believes in like the american dream and like if you work hard then and you deserve it then you will succeed and then her friend her friend uh jill uh is like she knows that the system is rigged she's like angela don't even try but angela just has this total faith in the system and when she she cracks when the system fails her yeah, she 
She and it, and it, she starts cracking on the ski trip. Yeah, yeah. Well, well. And, here, let's let's talk about um, Stacy okay. and 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 Tori because she's so she is the system. Stacy is the system. Uh, yes, she is the system. Yeah. How is she? The, how 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 is she the system? Do you think? I think she's a system. Well, w- one of the things I thought was very systematic is that they hired. Tori Spelling to play the lead. Yes. Yeah, no, talk about Tori at that time and what she represented. Okay, I will. So Tori Spelling, who I do love. Oh, girl, if you're listening, (laughs) I love you. I think you're so funny. You crack me up. I just think you're such a great comedian. Anyway, um, so she at the time was the kind of queen of teen TV in that she was, you know, she literally was living the Beverly Hills 90210 dream. Like, she lived in, a, she grew up in a place called The Manor. Her dad was Aaron Spelling, creator of Charlie's Angels, The Love Boat, uh, Fantasy Island, Family, like, you know, very s- popular, successful network television shows. Yeah. And she wanted to be an actress and she would sometimes get, you know, she had a lot of guest parts on her dad's shows and she helped cast now to an O. Oh really? Like she found Jason priest. Yes, yeah, she did. You loved nine Oh two one Oh like that oh was my God. you, you, I can attest like mm. you, that was, that was a major thing. And we will be seeing so some Shannon Doherty. Um, <laughs> later yes. on the show, definitely. My queen. Yes. My queen bee. Yes. Queen bee Brenda. <laughs> so what had happened was Tori had helped uh, cast now 2 and 0. She found Shannon Doherty because she saw her in Heathers. She found uh, Jason Priestley because she found him in the show Sister Kate that was canceled. So she had pretty much helped her dad cast the sh- the, the pilot Um because so many of the young actors that normally that were plugged into the agents that Fox worked with were all on these other like TV comedies, you know, things like that. So she helped find their two major players. And anyway, so because of this, I mean, a lot of the people on Naruto, the cast, I mean, they really, Tori, as you know, she was kind of like, I mean, she's very comedic, but she did have a lot of say and, and uh, power. I mean, she is the reason why Shannon Doherty did get fired. Yeah. So, so but but what what did she, at that time, in, 1990, in 1994, if you said Tori Spelling, what did people think? Oh, my God. What? Why? <laughs> they thought, I mean, a lot of people thought Tori Spelling was... Uh, I mean, they thought she was a, they thought it was a nepotistic, you know, her dad owes a, she's a rich girl. She's a rich Beverly Hills girl, uh, who has everything rich, a rich girl who has everything in, and her dad got her the part on a show and she's super powerful. Yeah. You know? And, and that's literally and, what she's playing in this movie. Exactly. And what is so wonderful is in her book, Tori Telling, I think it is. Yeah, yeah. Sto- she storytelling. That she was storytelling. She says that a lot of actors turned this down, but she accepted it and she was paid $100,000. And this turned out to be the most successful TV movie of all time, apparently. That's what she oh. says in her book. Now. Oh, wow. I just read I that it was the most successful movie of that TV movie of that year, but it it's it definitely legendary year, yeah. and like huge and it's, it might be. Yeah. So, um but I, you know, I, I, I read that book after I read, you know, The Rape of Nan King. So, I mean, I could have, I could have <laughs> <laughs> not remember, not, I could be misquoting. So, but yes, so Tori Spelling, in many ways, was Stacey Lockwood, you know, like everybody, you know, it, it almost is like, please, you know, I just, you're so confident. I want to be like you and you have all this power. You know, you, you, you go to all the right clubs, like you can get me on your dad's show. And so. and so then, we with Stacy, it's like she's she's the queen bee of the school. She, mm-hmm. um, uh, you know, and and she behaves very differently. She has, let's say, now Tori Spelling brought you know sort of a lot of her real life stuff to it, but she's very she's very much playing an archetype 
And Stacy kind of has, t- yeah. she has two modes. The way, or no, three modes, I guess. The way that she is with, um, with women, which is mm. bullying them into submission. The way that she yes. is with teenage boys, which is to immediately flirt and seduce them. And the way that she <laughs> is with adults, which is to be the sweetest little good girl that you ever saw. Yeah. In a way that's like and it works. transparently phony and it always works. Yeah, it always works. It's except on Jill, who seems to be like the only person who sees right through. Yeah. The, you know, the the girl who's bullied by her, you know, the goth girl and Jill are both like, no, yeah, she sucks. Yeah, no, yeah, no, let's talk about. So we've got um, so Angela is like feeling out trying to get popular. She has like a friend from her old school who's in the in crowd. So that's like her in. And she's like, I'm going to do this. I'm going to the world is mine. This is my year. And then we introduce Monica, who is this goth girl who is constantly in a rage like constantly in a blind rage she is never not furious it, that's what's really campy i don't know if they directed her to be that way but that part is like so campy yes and also i i don't mean i i don't mean to be ageist but she does look a lot like she looks like she's 29 yes she does and has been working at a club for some time yeah you know what i'm saying it it and she's always mad. She's already to pop off constantly. Yeah. And I was like, she's I, she's didn't like. Did you think it was weird that she would go on a ski trip? Oh my god. Okay. Yeah. So they the first big thing that they do is there's the ski trip, and Angela is like working and babysitting and doing chores and scrimping and saving to try to get on the ski trip, and then Monica. Now, okay, this is my theory. Is that what I gathered is like. Stacy and Monica used to be friends and Monica used to be part of the in crowd and then Monica like turned goth and Stacy saw that as a betrayal and then she was like you're weird and to Stacy weird is the worst thing that you can be weird is the kiss of death yeah. and then she's going to I... make it her mission to destroy you because you're and because she's the status is... quo and you're against the status quo Yes, and that is so, like, you're weird, you're different, you do something different, you're out, you're wrong, very, like, Reaganomics type, you're, what is wrong with you, you know, why are you different, why are you, why are you making it hard for people, because that's what Kelly Martin says about Monica, it's like, you know, she's doing the peer, peer counseling, and she's like, well, sometimes when you do drugs, it's like, how do you even know Monica's (laughs) doing drugs, and like, you're just assuming because she dresses this way she's doing drugs like how nancy reagan and and neoliberal of you to be like that's such a status quo thing and close-minded thing to say it's just reminded me of south bend and my family so much yeah like, which is we're oh. we're both of us both of us are from south bend indiana um that's where we grew up that's where we met um and so you know, yeah, yeah, it, it definitely has that, even though this is set in like, a, like, like a very wealthy, you know, it's like, there's still, you know, South Bend has those people who have money who are like the upper, this, this thing hits home. And with the Catholicism, there, the Catholicism, okay. Um, so let's take a little, a little trip fr- from the, from the ski trip, uh, the Catholicism. Angela's mom and her family and her sister. Um, Valerie Harper is Angela's mom. Yeah, amazing. She's really good. She Ugh. gives a really good performance. The the one thing yeah. is it it took me a minute to accept her because like because she's Rhoda from Mary Tyler Moore. She's like one of the most famous Jews on TV. <laughs> and she's playing this like devout Catholic, and I was like, but it, but she she really gives a great performance. She's very soulful, and 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 she's part of this like chorus of people who are all telling Angela like, be happy with what you have, Angela. You're good enough on your own, you know. Ugh. Um, and her sister, like who's like, <laughs> you know, adulthood isn't that great. You like. <laughs> Having a job sucks, and Angela's like, it's not going to be yeah. like that for me. I'm going to be an author oh, sh- like Danielle Steele, and I'm going to be... 
you know. That was that was great. <laughs> yeah. That that to me, like, you know, uh, if you just work, it was like very delusional. It was almost like uh, what is that uh, cognitive dissonance, like when you're telling somebody something and the person refuses to hear you and they just shut you down and they're like, no, no, I'm not going to hear you. Like, no, I, I believe you can work hard and maybe that's for some people, but not me. Mm -hmm. It's not going to be me. And it's like her sister's like, meanwhile, eating, a, <laughs> eating a cucumber <laughs> in her car. So this, this is something that I thought was, was interesting. You're talking about like this cognitive dissonance thing. Okay, yeah. so the costume design. The way that Angela is dressed throughout this whole thing. Now, you would think if someone is like, I'm going to be, you know, I'm going to be popular, they would start, like, dressing sexier or acting differently. But yeah. Angela yeah. wears the dumpiest clothes. She has her hair yeah. with, like, a little barrette. She is just the the sweetest most naive, most sexless little girl type that you could imagine. And she's with like Tori Spelling, you know, in like a crop top with her like toned yeah. body and everything. And, and you know, next to her, uh, Kelly Martin looks like she's about 12. And, and, but, but she just keeps trying and she never changes herself. She just thinks that like, if she just like works hard enough then she can do it it I, I thought that was so interesting that she doesn't like she 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 doesn't understand why people won't accept her when she looks the way that she does which is like you know i think yeah. dumpy and little girl well, that's interesting because I think that comes from like a lack of self awareness which she clearly has. Yeah she lacks self-awareness about those that connection but she also lacks a, a, any fashion influence coming into the house if you look she's mirroring like her sister's kind of her sister isn't totally dumpy but her sister isn't if she's you know she's like one of those professional adults who who probably has like an administrative job and she fits right in in that kind of context you know but her mother, she kind of mirrors her mom. Like her mom has a similar, puts her hair back with the with the pin, wears that the frumpy dress, you know. So I think it's also she wants to be something, but she doesn't know how. She doesn't have access to it. She doesn't understand the connection. Yeah. It's almost like it's like that false sense of manifestation that people have, like when they're like, I'm gonna manifest I'm gonna manifest the man of my dreams. And and, and they just you know, they sit at home and they write, the man of my dreams is this, the man of my dreams is that, but they never like work on themselves. They never become the person of their dreams to attract the man. Of their yeah. Dreams. Yeah. Yeah. And that, and that, you know, going back to, so we're, we're on this ski trip and she's worked so hard to get to the ski trip and she has, she can't afford the cute snowsuit. You know, and, it's and, cute. and then that mannequin was hot. Yeah. Well, and then she the goes and, Stacy is wearing the exact cute snowsuit that she couldn't afford. And Stacy looks great. Yeah, and it looks great. And she's wearing this sort of like, you know, she's like, I look like a pear. She's wearing this sort of like beige oh. one. And the moment when the the whole thing turns, like the first thing that like knocks her off of this mission that she's got is they're all dressed up and they're going off and Stacy turns to her and says, nice clothes, Angela. Where'd you get them? A thrift store? Yeah. Yeah. They and, all, Cause they all laugh. Mm -hmm. Cause they all laugh. And, and it's because it's because, um, you know, uh, uh, Monica, the goth, Monica, the angry goth yeah. was on the, the, the trip and, uh, Stacy was coming for her, reading her, her diary. Like you said, and Angela was like, hey, that's private. You know, she dared to, oh. to confront her in some way. Um, oh, yeah. And then, do that. Yeah, and Never so did. then she was like putting her, cutting her down and putting her in her place. And, but it's true though, that like Angela clearly does not belong. Like she's not, like she, 
you know, they can smell it on her that she's like, you know, she's not on their level. She's like a cheap imitation. Um, uh, you know, and, and yeah, she's like, a, you know, she's a wannabe. And that whole yeah. system is set up in a way. It's like, you need to have all these things and have this money and have all this stuff to be able to belong so that to keep people like her out and she doesn't get that. Yeah. No, she doesn't. The point is to keep her out. <laughs> and so then speaking of that, so there's this whole thing with like joining the Larks and uh, which is like this club, this little social club and, and the hazing thing that you were talking about where like they put the, they put like they put like a dab of mayonnaise on their heads, which I thought was really yeah. <laughs> interesting. And then have them, you know, do this little hazing thing. And Angela actually gets into the Larks, but then yeah. there's the cheerleader tryouts. Now, this, if we're talking about campy moments, this was the other moment. It could be campy, but then also I don't know. It, 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 it was interesting. So Angela is objectively bad at cheering she's like she can't get the beat she's really she's awkward and she's really trying but she's so bad and then the cheerleading coach comes and calls stacy up and is like stacy you seem to have the routine down and tori spelling is not good <laughs> like oh, yeah. like she's not she's like come on warriors fire it up like it's and and then i noticed they like they cut to like a close-up of her and then they cut to like a close-up of angela watching her and i'm like oh that's so that they don't have to show her they must have been like do we have coverage can we like can we cut to something <laughs> because I'm because laughing because I've done Because that. we've shot this, I'm like, because we've shot, we've, you know, we've tried this, like, you know, we've done 15 takes of Tori trying to do this thing and, like, you know, let's just move on. Let's keep it going. We've got a schedule. This is the, this is what I imagine. This is my fan fiction about this scene. Um, <laughs> but, but then on another level, I'm like, that does kind of work because it's like, Stacy isn't really particularly great you know like she's not like yeah. stunningly beautiful she's not like a great cheerleader but she's just like the she's like the richest and the most powerful and so she gets everything even if she's not the best yeah. exactly and that is so right on with how i i guess how people i think envisioned tori spelling in 1994 yeah as the girl who gets everything because of who she is because that's that is kind of how it seemed yeah you know for for a long time yeah know? yeah she she eventually had a sort of you know fall from from grace and had to like become a normal person but she really grew up in this like super rich sphere where it was just she had she carried the entitlement with her it was just there it was part of her the then they announce the cheerleaders and it's like they're announcing fucking prom queen it's so <laughs> I, I, it, like you know they, they like call the person down and everybody applauds and i think they give them like a sash or something it was so over the top um and then one this is okay then it, it leads to one of my favorite moments of the movie where um and angela is devastated that she doesn't get cheerleader and she's crying and i mean and it's it's really it's actually a good scene where she's crying in the bathroom and she's just completely distraught inconsolable so then she's walking home and her sister pulls up and is like come on let me give you a ride home and her sister keeps a huge <laughs> butcher knife in the car to cut up vegetables and so then she sticks a huge cucumber and a giant knife in angela's face and goes cucumber <laughs> and i was just i i died it was just like that was the most and then she's like i hate cucumbers um and i was just like 
one of the things about TV movies is that they make everything super clear. They do not want to leave any sort of loose ends. And so it's just like this cucumber with this giant knife. And she's like, cucumber? And... But, um, yeah, yeah. And it makes no sense. So this is... So in the actual... Like, in the actual crime, what... Um, I mean, her name isn't really Angela in real life, but th this person who committed the crime said that her sister kept a butcher knife in her car to cut vegetables for snacks. And then somebody was like, why would you keep a 12 inch knife in your car to cut vegetables? That doesn't make sense. Um, it was her saying that it wasn't premeditated, that the, car the knife just uh, happened yeah. to be in the car instead of her bringing it in. So this is the way of setting up like yeah. there's a knife in the car, but like... I'd listen. I don't buy it. I don't buy a, a foot long knife to cut cucumbers. No. I'm. <laughs> I'm. It, it, it like it. 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 I. I honestly, I think after last year, everyone thinks cucumbers in general are suspicious. <laughs> like no one, no one thinks when you're bringing a cucumber into any conversation <laughs> these days. After what happened with Hilaria, nobody. Nobody yeah. can trust a cucumber. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but uh, yeah, I mean, it, it is it is really ridiculous. Like who? Dr and like also, like hello, Angela's depressed. Like you know, and you're like cucumber. <laughs> like her sister is so bad at like reading the room. How bad are you at reading the room? You know, it's just that God. moments like that are great. Like the, those are those are the the TV mo movie camp moments that like I love and make this and make this movie fun. Like it is, it's like a fun yeah. movie. It's not like a devastating movie to watch, really. Um, oh no, I, I I have I I can sit back and watch this movie. You know to decompress or like you know how i got back into tv movies was uh after the trauma of making my first feature how traumatic uh that was because it coincided with the 2008 crash yeah on the aftermath of that and like the obama administration response to it and basically you know the millennial dropping out of the wealth category and all you know yeah the, the shit the hitting also, the fan the, the the shit hitting the fan like our whole you know for 10 years like pretty much our our country was on hold you know like holding its breath and uh there was no economic movement and coming from the trauma of making that you know emo you know that just the to topic is rough but then the way that i was treated while i was making it and the aftermath and how i continuously to be tr was treated and uh, how the work was treated and how uh a lot of trauma bonding that happened and and you know just a, it's it could be a whole movie itself so i really got into fun like i went right into flabulous after i made uh woman's prison because i didn't want or execution of julia mabry because i didn't want to feel i didn't want to feel anything again i just i just wanted to it was like i cracked open and i just i just wanted to go to you know showbiz pizza <laughs> in 1982 or something i i just never i just wanted bright colors because like i came from film school and film school oh my god everyone in film school takes themselves so seriously it's super intense like you know everyone is like what is a film a film is this a film is good a film is antonio and, yeah. and like yeah you know and it's and there's no sense of humor in film school you know it's it's you know no sense of queerness no sense of fun in camp everything is very serious and uh you're just competing with each other and uh it's very it, the school i went to wasn't very collaborative it was very competitive yeah so um so i needed something fun and the the tv movies what it did for me was help me confront what i was ashamed of i was afraid i was ashamed of my womanhood and how I was treated, like there's no room for femininity in the in the film business. Yes, you know, uh, ew, you're a woman. Like, and it's it's like to be a woman in the film business is to remove femininity from your womanhood. Meaning, you have you don't look like a woman if you are a woman. 
if you are a woman, then you, you should be gay because you're going to, it's like you're setting yourself up to be completely devastated when your man leaves you for a younger woman or cheats on you with the younger woman. You know, there, it, it, the idea is to be this tough career, career woman. And I say this like, you, you mean like as a, as, as a director, as a director, as an agent, mm-hmm. as a, you know, as a, as a working acquisitions, any sales accounts in film, uh, sales agents, entertainment lawyers, yeah. any type of uh, heavy duty behind the scenes mover and shaker. Yeah. Uh, without like, you know, public leverage. Yes. You are expected to be a eunuch, uh, uh, but a non-sexual kind of... Um, non-threatening non-sexual but i'd say you know you can be you can have a vagina just don't ever talk about anything involving it yeah or you're hurt because then then yeah. it's like then people won't people won't listen to you they won't take you as seriously no they won't they will not and and uh the times that they will are as if you are attached to a man you know, meaning like you are somebody important's daughter, you have really big backing, a lot of men uh, honor you, uh, protect you. But uh, the way the way I saw it was very much in the way I was treated, especially when I was making the execution of Julia Mabry, because before I made this movie before Orange is the New Black. And uh, it was like I men men like when we would have writing table reads of this uh and it, it, there would be fights, there would be accusations, like this is a feminist agenda and you're trying to make men look bad. And I'm like, no, this is literally what it is like for people who have been treated this way. They literally don't have middle class experiences. They don't have safe experiences. Yeah. And I'm, I'm not going to lie about that. I'm not going to lie so you feel better yeah. about yourself. Uh, so that it was really psychically hard because I was so naive at the time. I really thought oh, if I make something and I was like Angela, like I, I honestly was to think about it. Like I was like, if I work really hard and I show the public w- my insides and how I really feel and I and I am earnest about it and I'm insincere, I will be successful. Yes. I will be rewarded. I, and, and in some ways I was rewarded, but Jesus <laughs> Christ, I was punished. I was punished, you know, and thank God for the, the freaking Gen Zers who are amazing and, and get it, you know, that are like, yeah, embrace your womanhood. It's, empo-, you yeah. know, they're not like these stuffy third and fourth wave feminists who are like, and, and these Gen Xers who are all like, oh, I can't, be-, and, you know, some millennials that are like, I can't believe, like, Ugh, you, you're oh, showing your body, yeah. like, you know. And I hate that for me, it's like, oh, like just me doing something becomes a political act, even if even if like me making a movie becomes a big deal because somebody who looks like me and has my body shape and someone who has my opinions and who looks like me, you know, is making the movie. And uh, I equate that to be like I always tell people, it's like when you go to a slaughterhouse, who is who's who's running a slaughterhouse, a cow or a human? <laughs> You know, they don't let cows run slaughterhouses. Yeah. So why would they let a woman who, who looks like me with, you know, who's thick and, and opinionated, why would they let a woman who's normally sexually exploited or killed or who's a victim, who's like a dead body, you know, no human, no human found, you know, like the no human found thing on, on law and order and stuff. They always find dead hookers like Every time I was mainstream cast in anything, I was always playing a sex worker, which is hilarious because I hate yeah, sex. And, right. And, you know, I do, I'm like the most unsexual person you'll ever meet. So, and, uh, it, you know, but they see me and they're like, oh, we, this is how we sell her to the male gaze at large. You know, like we have to either kill her or sex Yeah, they were just her. like boobs. She has no nuance. That's all. Boobs. Yeah. We got to sell it. Uh, that's it, you know. And... And the only place for nuance I ever found with women that that went into their things were either comedies that were, you know, uh, offbeat or camp, 
uh, or TV movies. TV movies had more than one kind of like they weren't really made for the male gaze. Yeah. You yeah, know, no, that's they're, that's the they're there's, made for the female. There's gaze. a total female gaze. There's a female and like name name one consequential man in this movie. Oh, they don't exist. Uh, they don't. You know, yeah, like the father. They're all oblivious. Yeah, the father is oblivious. The principal's oblivious. There's like some boys that you know, like some boyfriends hovering around. None of them matter. It's all about the women in this in this movie. Yeah, and and men are just yeah. like you know uh they're they're just oblivious and they don't matter and and that's what is also interesting is the principal because he gave me the creepiest vibe yeah he was with he, how we talked to stacy oh yeah no he's he, it's like wait a minute i i have the the quote where he's like uh how's our prettiest how's our prettiest office assistant today sir that's sexual harassment and she's like oh ah. <laughs> yeah now now comes the point in the movie where the break happens where uh angela gets the really bad idea and she's like i'm gonna invite stacy to this party and that's gonna make her my friend which is like it's it's almost like a it's almost like an elementary school thing so then she has this whole plot where she she gets access to the car and she makes sure that Stacy is going to be ready under like a pretext for this thing from the Lark Club that they belong to. And then she's there. She picks up Stacy and says, oh, I just made up that excuse for your parents. We're going to this party. And that's when everything goes wrong. And um, Stacy knows that she's like so tell me about this party and angela's like i don't really know about it well uh, who invited you well i'm not really invited um and i think legitimately stacy was like you know what the hell is this um but the, she's like she, and she they're in the the, the church parking lot and stacy was like okay i gotta smoke some weed before i go to this thing so she's like smoking weed and (laughs) you know and angela's like horrified you know so this is what i thought was very interesting about this let me let me lay this thing out and then i'll tell you my thought and uh, and i'll see what you think okay so i want to hear then stacy is like bring me home i don't want to go to this party this is a bad idea um and then Angela is like, Stacy, why are you so mean? I admire you so much, and you're so pretty, and you're so funny, and all that I want to do is be your friend. And and she gets really intense, and Stacy's like, You're weird. Like, what are you, you know, take me home now. And and Angela's like, No, I don't like, why are you why are you being like this? And she gets super emotional. Um and then Stacy's like, well, why don't you just go with Monica to the party? And then she gets out. And then it's like clear, like, oh no, Angela's. And she says that Angela's weird. And suddenly Angela's like, oh my God. I. But then she's like playing in her head what Stacy is going to say the next day. And um, she was like, she imagined Stacy being like, she told me that I was pretty and I was funny and she just wanted to be my friend. It was like she was asking me out on a date or something. And I was like, oh, oh my God. I think that Angela might have like deeply buried, sublimated, like, uh, you know, sexual feelings for Stacy. Well, to be fair, to be fair, um, in high school, it is often, it's called a girl crush, and it's not like, there's a whole song for yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. women, they, they, it's like they covet, uh, like, for instance, like, I, like, love Shan Doherty, but that was because I saw myself in her, and I was like, oh my god, I could be, like, I want to be like her, because people tell me I look like her, and I love her. Yeah, yeah, know? yeah. Or, 
and and it becomes this like infatuation with that person yeah um like i really wanted and i remember in high school i really wanted popular girls to like me and i would fixate on oh my god if i was them my life would just be so much better and uh, my mom would like me my dad would like me and i'd be accepted my life would have a purpose and you would form these infatuations on girls that were popular not sexual but like in posturing like if i was them yeah everything would be better because they have it all everybody likes them yeah versus versus and like i understand she could have supplement you know she could have some um like i don't think that that's what the filmmakers are trying to say but i just got like no, a no, i no. i got like a vibe i got like a like a, a, a you know a queer like repressed cuz in in my experience like when you're in a religious you know circumstances and you're having those feelings then yeah you explain them in every single other way that you can. You're like, no, I just, I just really admire them. I just really, you know, it's not that. And it's like, you can't even admit it to yourself. So, and I guess I was like, it makes more sense for her to just go completely batshit and like want to stab Stacy. If there's that, because she's like, Oh my God, you know, like now she's going to go around telling everybody that I have a crush on her, you know? Oh, but in high school, can I tell you that is like the that is literally a career high school killer yeah. is to be, you know, they're gay. And, you know, that. Yeah. I mean, every everybody, even in the you know, even in the 90s, like, oh, yeah, as as much as everyone was like, I'm bisexual, <laughs> as long as, you know, like I have a boyfriend. Yeah, yeah, you know, yeah. My boyfriend can watch. I'm bisexual type thing. Um, It it was like, oh, like you like it was you were you were blacklisted from the queen bees yeah, for sure totally. it wasn't it wasn't it wasn't something that uh was uh no and so i when when i saw that sequence i was like oh my god the filmmakers get it they get what it's like to be a teenage girl right now and know that um because that's what people used to call me like um like, because I, in high school, like, I did not have sex with anybody. Mm. And I was called names. I was called a tease. And I uh, didn't want to. So what I'm trying to say is, like, I got, I remember what it was like when guys would be like, you don't want all the girls to tell, you don't want me to tell everyone you're gay, do you? Or uh, I'm going to tell everyone you're gay if you don't make out with me. And uh, girls would be like, oh, she's, why don't you like this guy? Come on. Like, why don't, like, I had a girl down the street pressure me to have sex with her friend. Uh, he was a guy, obviously. And she was like, why, why won't you do it? Are you gay? And I'm like, uh, I just don't want to. Like, it was really weird. Like, yeah, uh, yeah. Yeah. So, so it is a real, it's a real tactic to to corner someone and be like oh you're weird you're gay don't you you want me you can't have me it's like really it's really fun. yeah yeah so then she's like okay i can't this this cannot stand and she confronts stacy and stabs her and it's really it's really intense so stacy is dead and angela just like uh is going about her business and nobody suspects her. And then there's the, um, the FBI come in on the case. And then there are these FBI interrogation scenes. Now I was like, did they bring in a different director for these? Because those interrogation scenes are like amazing. They're on this whole other level. Like, the rest of the movie i think like i was saying people are archetypes you know like everybody's i think uh like kelly martin plays on multiple levels sometimes but usually everybody's playing on one level you know yeah and then these interrogation scenes where it's like like suddenly like they're doing these super close-ups on kelly and she's got these huge eyes that are just staring at you yeah and and Mm -hmm. like she's playing it 
she's playing the thing entirely she's lying but she's playing the lies entirely credibly but like in a way just because of the way that the dialogue is and everything we can sort of like see her mind working and her being like oh i should put this thing in and i should mention this um but just the way that she's playing it all off i i and and then them being like very friendly and but then there's another thing underneath it I, there are just all of these different levels um to it and i was like oh my god like the scene is great and there was no music to it because i yeah. which i think helped because i don't i don't think that the score is great in this movie oh, i'm not crazy about the it's score not it's not good yeah no, they, they have this like really cheesy electric guitar that comes in sometimes. That's actually very 90210. Those interrogation scenes, I was like, oh my God, like Kelly Martin is fantastic. Like this is, this is so good. Now that Stacy's dead, um, Angela suddenly becomes popular. It, there's like this like popularity void and she comes up to fill it and she like you know gets a better place in the larks and she's like you know volunteering at all these places and boys start asking her out and suddenly like her hair looks better and her clothes start like showing her shape and she's like you know suddenly she has breasts that she never had before and you're like where did those come from um and 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 it's like she's living her dream She's the thing that she always wanted to be, but she's suffocated by the guilt. Um, and uh, yes. yeah, and there, there's this one scene that, that um, really struck me with the, the one where she's working in the hospital is the candy striper. Oh, I love that scene. Oh, that's one of my favorites. Where there's like, there's this old woman who's senile and they tell her to like, go, you know, see what's wrong with her. And she's like, I know you. I know what you are. Get away from me. And and like it's legitimately like like the the, the actress who's playing this senile old woman really puts it in where I was like that's creepy. Yeah, it's terrifying. <laughs> and it especially if you have a guilty conscience and and it like even for me like you know, I'll just be feeling bad because, oh, I didn't practice today or, oh, I didn't like exercise or, oh, I, I didn't write or something. And if I had walked into that just with my own neuroses <laughs> and my own like, you know, relationship with guilt, I would be like, oh, my God, she knows. Like, I I ate all the ice cream. <laughs> oh, God. I, uh, like the things that I beat myself up for. Like, I mean. So it, that was terrifying, and I was like, oh, my God, the old, that woman knows. She's like, and I was like, oh, my God, there's going to be a plot twist. Yeah. Like, the first time I saw it, I was like, it's going to be, like, the sixth then. <laughs> like, and then she was volunteering at this candy striper, and this lady knew. Oh, my God. But the, it's like, that. that's the thing that, that gets her, is the guilty conscience, because then we've got this other FBI interrogation scene. And like everybody at school thinks that Monica the goth did it and they're like throwing shit at her and chasing her. Um, and, and then there's another FBI interrogation and they basically have like clocked Angela. And that, that was like yeah. my favorite scene in the whole movie when they're like, um, when they're confronting her, the FBI agents are like confronting her and they're like being really nice and she's like, oh yeah, this is fine. And then it changes and she's like, oh my God, they've got me. And she's like trying to figure out if she can get out of it. And then she realizes that she can't. And they're like reading a description, like a psychological profile of, of, the, um, of the killer. The and killer. they're like, what do you think of that? And she's like, I think that sounds like me. And they were like, we did too. And... <laughs> <laughs> and you're like oh fuck but then uh they they don't have any evidence against her so they have to like get her to confess so they're using her catholic guilt against her and then there's the whole thing with her confessing to her mom 
Now, the letter. The letter, yeah. The way that that whole thing. Okay, so this is this is what gagged me. <laughs> is she she's like she keeps trying to tell her mom, and her mom is like you know like oh I'm tired you know let's talk tomorrow let's you know let's do this and then and she's like going to church and there's like organ music and like shadows <laughs> cross her face and it's like super Catholic and she's just marinating in guilt and then she writes her mom a letter and hands it to her mom and is like I oh, know I don't want to talk I, I wrote I wrote you a letter about it um, I, I have to go to school and it's like to mom and dad and so her mom goes and sits down at her desk pulls out her bible gets her rosary sets the timer which we've seen her doing to like do her like her 15 minutes of like bible study or whatever and just sets the thing aside and doesn't read it and i'm like what kind of mother are you I know. I was like, she's not going to read it right away. She's going to she's going to do her morning. Before. Yeah. Yeah. Be, I mean, because I guess they just figure like, well, nothing very bad could ever happen, you know, to Angela. She's such a nice girl. Oh, they're not paying attention. I mean, their 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 daughter is so obviously saying things that they even, you know, in that conversation the mom has with the husband. It's like she has such big dreams. Why is she? Because the dad is like, I think she's ashamed. Yeah. And the mom's like, no, she isn't. And it's like, ugh, lady. She totally yes, fucking Yes, your is. daughter is very, your daughter's totally ashamed. Of, of being lower middle class, of being from the, she doesn't want to take people home. She doesn't want them to see the way that she is. But then, so then she reads it. Uh, she picks up Angela at school. They're both weeping. And then there's this big trial. And there's this whole section of the movie where it's like now she's caught and they're having this trial not really because they need a trial like they already have a confession but they just want to sort of like have a trial one thing i noticed is that they suddenly they have all these fade outs in the editing and i was like this looks like law and order felt like a giant tone shift yeah but the trial was fascinating to yeah. me because that was when you you saw like how the mean girls were you know her her beehive the Stacy Lockwood beehive was you know they'd go up to Jill uh, Angela's friend and be like you can't be here so it still showed like you know how the mean girls were still unified you know and then Jamie <laughs> leaving the mean girls in yeah a way she oh to, not even in a way she completely breaks with them and like. Yeah. reverts back to her old like catholic school self yeah and to be to be there for angela yeah well there were two two things that i noticed during that that section the first was i was like wow this movie is 100 percent on angela's side like like oh, it, yeah. is so, it is so it is so pro angela um and really you know is like yes she killed her but doesn't she feel bad enough <laughs> like um but then um also her friend jamie uh yeah. has like a complete change of character and she's one of the few people in this movie who like has like a character arc where she changes um and as a reaction to that she like she drops out of school she's she's like going to church again she goes back to uh catholic school and she's like you know trying to to be a friend to to angela she totally pulls away from the materialistic like hot girl you know mean girl thing yep. and 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 you know all of this stuff that everybody's been saying like you're you're good enough as you are you know it, it, she's embodying that it's like she learned the lesson from it and i was like this is like a very like moral kind of religious movie in a way like ultimately that's it says that that's the thing it's like find solace in like friendship and community and you know and and religion and not in uh you know materialism and and uh you know winning and being the best 
this is based on a real life thing. And the real people, Angela, her real name was Bernadette, of course. Um, yeah, Bernadette Prati. And Stacy was uh, uh, Kirsten Costas. There was really no evidence. Like, it, none of this came up that, like, that, uh, that Kirsten, the, the, you know, the popular girl, was, like, a mean bitch. Um, you know, like, I think there was there was some kind of thing that that somebody made a comment about um uh bernadette's like outfit on a ski trip but that was literally it mm -hmm. and then they took that and like ran with it and made stacy just this like irredeemable bitch and i was like man it's bad enough that this girl got stabbed to death but now <laughs> now she's like this horrible bitch on tv and <laughs> And she can't do anything about it because she's dead. Um, you know, I mean, I'm sure her family was like, I'm sure her family was horrified. Why is our daughter being played by Tori Spelling and why is she so mean? Yeah. The way I see it, I could have had some jealous girls do this to me. Yeah. Because I had some, I had a lot of jealous girls in high school. Yeah. They could easily have done this to me and, and projected the same story. And what what is sad is that uh, there is a there is a, a victim uh, for for Kirsten, the girl who was murdered. There is like you know an online community that discussed this death of a cheerleader movie, saying, you know, it, it what you're exactly saying is like it's bad enough she was murdered, <laughs> yet you're making <laughs> you're making her look like she was an awful like person. she had it coming. You, yeah. you know what I mean? Like she had it coming, and oh what a relief because. You know, in a way, it's like Angela got rid of the evil in this community. You know, she she taught us a moral lesson because the priest says that, like, you know, in the eulogy or his uh, he gives a sermon and he's discussing like how there's too much greed in the community and the the pressure to be perfect is is bad. And it's like she taught them a moral lesson. Yeah. Like, and it's it's the weirdest TV movie where it's almost like they had to make the the girl because Tori's mean she's not nice and she's very unsympathetic you don't feel sorry not for her you're like oh she was mean as hell and uh so it it becomes like oh Angela you know she she just really believed in the American system and it like failed her you know like they failed her but she got rid of the boogeyman but it's not that's not the tv movie way to have like to end on an ambiguous note that's not a tv movie thing like we gotta we gotta wrap this up with a oh. bow this was like you know it was the biggest tv movie of like 1994 one of the biggest tv movies like ever um so much so that i what is it in 20 19 was it that they did a remake yeah they did they sure and did. brought back kelly martin as one of the fbi investigators um but nobody liked it as much as the original they were like we're gonna do it much more realistically and and nobody <laughs> nobody really liked it they were like this isn't fun no. 2021 there's this band called pom com pom pom squad and they're very influenced by like 90s alternative rock and they did this sort of like viral video where uh, the band, uh, it's like a, you know, like a f female, I think it might be an all female band or like majority female band. And they cover not a surf song popular and like recreate the whole video shot with like the lead singer playing every single part. Um, oh. But they had a 2021 album called Death of a Cheerleader. And, <laughs> and it had yeah. all of this like cheerleader imagery and it, all of the videos were like centered around that and then apparently like olivia rodrigo with her album sour there were she used all this cheerleader imagery like immediately after that and everybody was like she's stealing that from the pom-pom squad's death of a cheerleader album um so i you know i have no i have no proof I can't, you know, I'm not accusing Olivia Rodrigo of anything, but that was definitely something that was part of the conversation was like, you know, um, 
And so I was like, that's interesting that even now that phrase, death of a cheerleader, is like coming back into like, it's, it's, it's there in the mainstream. Style. Well, I mean, one, one thing I liked about this TV movie was it really did, sh- it really did capture how uh, the, the hive mentality of, of a queen bee and her, her drones yes. in a, in a, in a like actual way that is not, you know, like the movie Mean Girls shows it be a nice little ending to it and no one dies and everybody this learns something. is really tragic. Yeah. Yeah. And Angela in this is like, you know, she's really distraught. I mean, she really, it really emotionally, like the way Kelly Martin plays it is like, you really do feel for yeah. her in a many Yeah, ways. you do. Like, you're like, ooh. Because you just see her. And you're embarrassed for her. A you lot. are embarrassed yeah. for her. It's like, it's like watching somebody run into a wall over and over again. And you're like, <laughs> stop hurting yourself. Yeah. And Kelly Martin is so good at that. She's the only actress I I have seen that was a that was a teen actress willing to to do that kind to of to make work her to make camera. herself look completely just like awkward and 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 terrible. Yeah, and and she went there. She went there a lot, even on Life Goes On, and she was on ER and did that. Like she was in another TV movie with Patty Lapone, which we should discuss. Oh. Which I thought she everybody was brilliant in it i feel like she's very underrated she never got the cred that she deserved for for doing the work and that she's done yeah. with her abilities to be so like you know tragic and and uh devastating and embarrassing in a non-vanity way like you know how you can watch an academy award winning movie or like a award season movie and you you're like oh like they're wearing prosthetics to be unattractive and they're giving a performance. Mm-hmm. Like I I feel with Kelly Martin, like she's really showing it. Like she's not like giving a performance, like not letting the press she's not being ugly. Like she's really showing this like embarrassing belief. The cringiness. Yeah. Like she'll go there. Yeah. And I love that. And that is that is something I still have not seen in on, on a a lot of actresses do period it in any movie yeah like especially for for teens like she did it and in most my so-called life didn't even do it my so-called life was mostly you know uh the character angela just pouting and being like whiny and like i don't know yeah ah." well i like but she didn't really embarrass yeah well and i mean even i'm thinking of like in mean girls like they have Lindsay lohan you know looking you know like wearing oversized t-shirts but it just looks like Lindsay Lohan in oversized t-shirts. Like, you know, she's still, you're like, oh, that's a beautiful girl that they're trying to make look dumpy. Yeah. Um, But Kelly Martin really does. And she is very pretty, but like you, she just is that type of girl. She is a good Catholic girl, like to the bone. And she carries her. Yeah. She physically carries herself. That yeah. Way. Yeah. She physically carries her body that way. And and speaking on to cinematography, there were some really good tracking shots yes. in, in this where they would follow her around her house. Like the scene where she's talking to her sister and she st- walks out of the room and the way that they followed her through the house. So you see like the, the, the cluttering, like a good old cluttered Catholic yeah. house with too many kids and too many family photos, which I am used yeah. to, uh, you know, cluttered house. And she walks to her room and sits on her bed and like just the, the body language where she she's under the she, you know, she's stomping away from her sister. Like, yes, I believe this is going to happen. And she kind of sits on her bed defeated. Yeah. Yeah. So it, it's it's interesting because like we have these two people who completely inhabit their characters and their their on screen personas and their public personas inform the characters so much that they it, they just become them like we buy it I think that's I think that it, that is one of the things that like makes this TV movie stick in a way that others haven't because you know sometimes there'll be a tv movie and it's just like like barbara eden you know like from from i dream of genie you know there's one you know she's Mm -hmm. playing like a like a woman in peril and she's been kidnapped and she has like perfect hair and perfect eyelashes and you know um and or or things where it's like 
this actor is getting a chance to stretch. They're playing something, you know, but they don't necessarily quite pull it off or, you know. Um, yeah. But this, I feel like the, the two lead actresses, um, you know, one ha- may have a lot more technical acting ability than the other one, but they just are their parts so completely that like yeah. we we're there in it with them and they become these archetypes um and and i found myself thinking of that like even though i don't have that history with that movie but i you know i i'm thinking of kelly martin you know and her awkwardness and all of that stuff you know like in you know in my day-to-day life after watching this or, or the way that the, I, the Tory yeah. spelling is like, let's read her diary. Oh. You know, it's just like they're, they, they, they are those people so much that it, they just stick in your brain. <laughs> I, I, I definitely wanted to be in movies like this, you know, growing up. I was like, I hope I become a famous TV movie actress, you know, and can be in depth of a cheerleader. You know, I, I, cause I kind of feel like they have more interesting parts for yeah. women and they're not hypersexual. Yeah. Yeah. It wouldn't be you so. playing a girlfriend or something, you know, or a sex, sex. Yeah. Or, or, or a sex, sex bomb. Like, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So there's a line at the end of it. Um, the, the judge is talking and he's giving his sentence and he says, what have we accomplished here? I hope it was justice, though I fear it was nothing more than entertainment. And I was like, that might be the most self-aware thing ever said in any TV movie. Because it's yeah. like, that's, that's literally think... what, like, what have we accomplished here? I hope that it was justice, but I fear it was nothing more than entertainment. And that's ultimately... <laughs> what it is is using this thing for entertainment so they kind of call themselves out for it a little bit yeah i mean i i appreciate that and i think you know in a, some way i mean we're, we're creating a piece that's entertaining someone will listen to and we're using somebody's i mean you know i when i saw this didn't know it was a real case yeah. and now i do um but i do believe her killer was uh she has uh, been released and she has an alias. Yeah, she changed her name and, and started a new life. And there's people, I guess, on the internet who are, keep trying to track her down, but no one's really mm. been able to. But there are these people who are like, she can't just get away with that. We're going to find her and expose her. Um, and Maybe she was my boss recently. Yeah. Who knows? Maybe she's become the new meat yeah, girl. Who, who knows? <laughs> you know, but it's just, it's like... Um, yeah, they, people people have not let this case go. You know, something about it like caught the the imagination uh, of the public, and like there there are still people who are obsessed with it. So, but it's true. It's true. Well, and I and I think that's okay. I think you know, like that. You know, I think it's good because if I had been killed, I would probably want people to bother the person that murdered me for a long time. Yeah, no, that's... I don't know. I I mean, I'm just saying, like, you know, I'm just saying, like, I, I, it's, it's, I, that's the problem with true, when you do, where we're discussing, like, true crime stories, because you know that the people that, like, someone's tragedy has, in many ways, become entertaining. Yeah. And there are people out there who have to live with that consequence. And that is, like, one of the worst things I think inflicted on victims' families is that. Yeah. Um, Yeah, no, it's true. It's true. So we, we, you know, we might let um, Angela off the hook, but we're not necessarily going to let Bernadette off the hook. No. (laughs) And, yeah, all right. So this, we... We like this movie. There are campy moments. Oh, I love it. There are campy moments in this movie that make it fun. But overall, I don't think that it's a camp movie. Like, I think it, it sets out to do a thing and it succeeds at that thing. And it sticks in your brain. Yeah. And Kelly Martin is really, really good. And Valerie Harper is also very good. 
amazing. Yeah, I would give it four cucumbers. <laughs> four cucumbers. <laughs> this is Mother Murderer Podcaster <laughs> signing off. Bye.